Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome uh, to the uh, North Reading Candidates Night, sponsored by the North Reading Republican Town Committee. Uh, this is a special night for our town, uh, simply because this is what helps the community grow, be managed, and uh, through the, through the um, individuals stepping forward to represent uh, the, the town needs. Okay. First, uh, I would like to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm always afraid I'm going to make a mistake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Paranoia. laughs> Very useless. But in any event, so welcome to Candidates Night. Uh, it's since we've been doing this since 2018, and uh, we have uh, we started it because the League of Women Voters decided that uh, uh, they, well, they weren't able to do it. I think they dissolved, and we felt that this was an important event to do. And I, I think this year was even more special because the Democratic uh, Town Committee did a, uh, a candidate's night early in the month. The students at the uh, high school did it in the middle of the month, and here we are closing things out. And it's just so important that, that uh, everyone have an opportunity to hear what the candidates have to say. We're trying to reach out uh, beyond this room. Uh, it's being televised on NORCAM through the streaming that we, are, that we have set up. It's also being streamed on the North Reading Republican Town Committee Facebook page. Uh, so, so it's out there and people can become informed because that's what people need to do is to become informed about all the issues in this town. The issues in this town, uh, that are not always just limited to this town. Many times, what goes on the national stage goes on there. But what goes on here is important to us. It impacts our taxes and impacts the education of our children and, uh, and the growth of our town. There are many things going on. Uh, and I hopefully people are paying attention. So I want to thank Kitty's, Kitty's staff, uh, and I want to uh, also thank Debbie Bergmeier uh, for allowing us to use this room uh, as a community service. They are charging us for it. And uh, the gentleman over here, I'm sorry, your name again is? Phil Carboni. Yeah. Phil Carboni? Yep. Right? Uh, he has, uh, he set up these speakers for us. Very nice of him. He does weddings. So if any of you are going to get married again, uh, <laughs> he's your man. <laughs> Uh, but I want to thank you for doing that, for coming through for them, and for us, okay? Um, if you want to order something, uh, a beverage or so on, you can um, go to the bar and order uh, any type of drink that you'd like to have. Um, now, before we go on to the candidates, which is next, I just want to say we take this opportunity when we do our community service. One of the community services we do, in addition to this, is that we offer a scholarship award for students graduating from high school in North Reading. Now that doesn't mean just North Reading high school students, but, but residents of students with it being home taught, uh, home educated or not, uh, or at the school or at uh, St. John's or, what, or whatever school they go to, uh, if they submit an application uh, to the North Reading uh, uh, Town Committee, then uh, they can participate in our um, a scholarship uh, a program. The scholarship program is a very simple thing. It's an essay, about 500 to 600 words. It's uh, what the American flag means to me. Uh, the idea I started in 2014, and that idea uh, was to have students begin to take pause about what that what the flag means to them. It's very important. It's there sometimes. It's American flag can be like white noise. We don't want it to be white noise. We want it to mean something. So we want them to take a moment in time and just think about it. Uh, and it's been inspiring what we get back from students. The 
It's unbelievable. And you know, it's very difficult to pick out who should be the recipient because you get you get tugged by by the passion and, and, and the understanding and the appreciation that students do have. And it also reminds us that it's you know, the, when I grew up, you'd say, oh, kids today, you know? <laughs> that was my generation, they said that. Well, every generation gets picked on that way, don't they? And the kids today, they, 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 when they articulate their, their feelings for the flag, um, it, it's heartwarming. So it's good to know that the youth of America thinks about the country in, in a very positive way. So thank you. If you'd be so kind, we have a basket that's going around. We can accept donations and so on. Um, uh, Eileen has it. Roy's going to help out in that regard. So if, if you do that, that would be uh, so kind. The award that we gave is $750. So that's, that's a decent uh, scholarship award. So, but let us, not, uh, let us go forward and uh, let's, let's talk about the um, uh, candidates. All right. We have for our first speaker, uh, the uh, John Murphy, who is the town moderator, uh, he will give you an idea of what um, uh, what town moderator does, how they have to work in and make sure that everyone follows the four corners uh, of the rules. And, but I'll, he will articulate it by far much better than I will. John. Thanks, Jeff. Um, what I'll do is uh, talk about a job no one else wants. Uh, so I, I just want to take a few minutes, tell you a little bit about myself, and then uh, talk about town meeting, which is the purest form of democracy in the country. Um, so for myself, I, I moved here to North Reading in 1995 with my wife and two children. Um, they're both uh, grown up and gone. Um, well, one of them came back to live a mile from us. And uh, we have our first grandson, which is four months old, a little over four months old. And uh, I can walk to his house, walk to the house and play with him, or she can walk him to our house in the carriage. and. Um, it's, it, it's awesome. It's a great community to live in. Uh, when I first came to town, my wife told me no more politics. I came from Stoneham. Mm -hmm. I was chairman of the finance committee. Um, and she said no more politics. Um, September of 1995, we moved in. And uh, by December of 1995, I was vice chair of the elementary school building committee. <laughs> Not my choice. She told me to do it. I said, okay, I have your permission. Um, that was a great uh, opportunity. We did the little school. I started the hood school project. I chose to run for board of selectmen. I did lose. So I served on the trustees of trust funds. Um, and for those of you in town who don't know about the trust funds, go look, dig deep, because you can get some money. So uh, when I was on the trustees of trust funds, we funded the, the high school band uh, uniforms that are now getting replaced. <laughs> so uh, you know, was, uh, you know, my son was in band as well, but um, it's just a great, great community. So after serving on trustees of trust funds, I did get elected to the board of selectmen. Oh, what a ride that was, three years. And then next thing I knew, my wife said to me, She's going off to college soon, you know. You know you need to be around the house. You know you need to get to know your kids. And Klaus Kuriewski, for those of you who know Klaus, Klaus had served for 20 years as town moderator. I'm on 18, so you do the math. Uh, but Klaus had served as moderator for 20 years, and he had announced in August he was not going to run again. And I was up for re-election on the board of selectmen. And so I handed the transcript to my wife and she said, what else is involved? And I said, well, I get to judge the bikes at the Memorial Day Parade. <laughs> appoint, appoint the finance committee, very important role, and preside over town meeting. 
and I got the green light. And 18 years later, I'm still doing it. Um, Barbara beat me to the punch. Barbara retired in October. And I said, I am absolutely unequivocally going to run again because I think it's important for the community to have that continuity. And we have a new uh, town clerk and uh, Susan, who is incredible. I was blessed to be included in the hiring process in interviewing over Zoom <laughs> with COVID. But um, so it's been great. Um, but let's talk about town meeting for a minute. As I said earlier, purest form of democracy. Any registered voter can attend. Any guest or visitor can attend. If a guest or visitor wants to speak, I get to decide. <laughs> if a registered voter wants to speak, they can speak only when called upon, not stand up and stop shouting and screaming. And it's a it's a it's sometimes a tough role because there are deep passions on certain articles, but um, I've enjoyed all 18 years of it. Um, we've been able to accomplish um, most town meetings in one night and uh, everybody gets to say their piece. There's a five minute limit. Um, I follow the, the uh, US Constitution Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the town charter, and the town bylaws in making all of my decisions. I have a great team behind me in Boris Leckman um, and the support of town council. And uh, it's, I enjoy it. It's governed by Robert's Rules of Order. Um, I announced the sort of the, the rules and the protocols up front at the beginning of town meeting. And um, it's, it's just been a wonderful job. And the, the best part of it is I'm not political anymore because I'm Switzerland. I'm standing at the podium. Not tonight. Well, yeah, tonight I'm Switzerland too. Uh, but I don't have to, I don't have to opine. And I stay out of, for the most part, town politics. I do have a wife. I do have a daughter who lives in town now who's a taxpayer and her husband and my grandson. So I won't get involved in their politics and I won't tell them what to do with their politics, but I am Switzerland. And it's, it's kind of fun because you get to watch from afar. Having spent three years on the board of selectmen being in the thick of it and now get to just kind of sit back and say, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but I don't get to weigh in. I keep my opinion to myself. Um, so again, uh, if you've not been to town meeting, um, I would encourage you to go. And uh, if you have been to town meeting, hopefully you're happy with my performance. And uh, I ask for your support on May 2nd. And uh, I look forward to another term serving as moderator for the town of Notre Dame. May 3rd. <laughs> Okay, my calendar's broken. I've been busy. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all. Thanks for taking the time to be here. For, for, not for, just for me, but for all the candidates. And uh, I love this town, and I'm committed to this town, and I'll be here a long time, especially with my grandson down the road. Thank you all. Eighteen years. Who knew? Mm -hmm. Right, a long time. Uh, but he's done a super job. Uh, it was uh, tough to follow Klaus. Right, he was a. Uh, uh, he's been there. He was there twenty years. It was tough to follow him uh, at that at that time because no one knew. You know, they were so used to uh, Klaus that uh, um, he didn't know me. He, he's done a super job, and, and uh, I thank you for all the years that you, you have done this. You've done town meeting justice. Also, uh, next, uh, we have, um, from the Community Planning Commission, we have uh, Warren Pierce. Uh, unfortunately, David Butler is away. Regrets, as he says, uh, our business and is unable to attend. But uh, Warren Pierce here will give you an idea 
uh, what the CPC does and his role. And Roy Pierce is one of the most knowledgeable people in this town. So, welcome him. Thank you. Subdivision control, which means when people bring the subdivision into us, we have to review it and make sure it meets all the criteria um, for a subdivision. And they need an approval from us before they can build it. And anytime they do a lot creations uh, with what's known as A&R, approval not required, we still have to review it and make sure that it's a, legal, uh, a legally made lot because they have to register it with the registry of deeds in order for them to use it as a lot. So it is a there's a lot to that whole subdivision situation. We also do site plan review, which is which is commercial, it's for any business that comes in. And site plan review, um, besides looking at the um, the buildings and, and the way they're all situated, we look at the landscape, we look at the buffers to uh, the neighboring, whether the neighbors are residential or, or commercial, and how we can best uh, provide buffering for them. Um, and again, as a plan board, our, our primary goal is planning all the time. And for example, we've been working with the uh, town for the, on, this, uh, on the sewer district, and uh, hopefully we can get something put together with that. And we work with the town engineer and the Department of Public Works on the processes that they have. Uh, the building inspector is our enforcement officer, so if we have an issue with something that's been mandated or voted on by the board, the building inspector is the one that goes out and makes sure that uh, everything is done according to the plans. One of the biggest uh, issues that the state has facing it right now is housing, um, and not just not just general housing for people, but elderly housing and affordable housing. So there's a lot of pushes going on right now for the, by the state to try to get more housing, especially more affordable housing. Um, and we're involved, obviously, in that process. When we do um, when we approve subdivisions, we generally try to get them to give us at least one affordable unit, assuming that the project is large enough. To uh, to do that. And that's in our attempt to continue to chip away at that 10%. Um, the, town, the state wants the town to have at least 10% of their housing to be affordable. And if it's not, then we open ourselves up to the to things called like 40B, which is when the state can allow somebody to come in and build uh, buildings. And we've had 40Bs come in before. Uh, and so it's really kind of important that we hold on to our affordable housing, and, uh, uh, which includes the the property over at the very center there. So, uh, uh, if you look at over the years, Route 28 has been a problem ever since we've been trying, trying to make it look, trying to turn it into something that's a little, that looks a little better than just a, a run down the road. And over the years, we've managed to do a bit of that. If you look at the intersection of Lower Road and, and uh, 28, Look at how that quantity all opened up, and it's nice, nice buildings, pretty. Uh, same thing on the other end of town at Park Street and, and, uh, and uh, Main Street. That looks pretty good now, and, uh, we're, and we're continuously trying to make sure that the projects that, that are being done get done well. Uh, Walmart is a favorite subject of mine because when Walmart came in, by the way, Walmart didn't just decide to come. The way we got Walmart was uh, Stop and Shop was coming. Stop and Shop did a, uh, a very elaborate traffic study about to see how, every, what, how many customers they could get and whether it was worth building that Stop and Shop. So we borrowed it and sent it off to Walmart. We said, look at, look at this traffic count. Look at all these people. And they said, wow, we could put a store there. And we did. So that's how we got Walmart. But when they came in, they had this ugly building at Ace Harbor. And, uh, we didn't like it, so we actually encouraged them to be a little better in fire safe design. We told them basically what to do. Uh, it was interesting on the grand opening, they took credit for it, but that's okay, we got what we wanted out of it. Um, and 
and they, they gave us a bit of grief about that building, but when it was all built, it was absolutely beautiful, and now they copied that building style to three or four other places because it came out so well. So it was worth, worth putting the effort in. So um, as I said in the beginning, I've been at the board for a year, and I'm there to say it up to three at least. Um, I, I do enjoy the work. I like seeing the results of the work we did. I like seeing the town grow in a, in a productive and a, in a way in a way that uh, makes it look a little pretty, a little better, uh, come, come drive up and down that street. But I also want to say one, a couple of things about, uh, there are a number of people that are running out of bows here. And while uh, you may go in and say, well, you know, I don't need to vote for them because they're, you know, they're not opposed. But I, but I wish you would think about this because I, I want you to cast your vote based on whether how you feel about the job the person is doing because that's one of the things they can tell. If, the, um, if, they, if a particular person gets a large number of votes, uh, even though they're running out of votes, then these people approve of the job they're doing. So if you approve of the job that any one of these candidates is doing, give them your vote, even if they're unopposed. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, very informative. Uh, does anybody have a question uh, for Warren in regard to uh, anything coming up? <coughs> no? Yes, in the back. Quick question. Um, you notice like Ready in 28 had um, changed the traffic pattern and all that, and, and uh, the Freddy seems to have brag rates going on like all the time on it fully. Is there anything in the works on working on any of that? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, we've actually, um, we've actually looked at it. Uh, had a study that was done. We actually looked at doing something similar to it. You make it a three lane, that is two lanes and then a turn lane in the middle, um, looking for the feasibility of that. But of course, what we're trying to do is um, um, put put together a plan that, that accomplishes that goal. But we're trying to uh, have it done simultaneously with the installation of sewer. Because if we're going to dig the road up and repave it, we might as well do it when we do sewer. So if we can get the sewer project moving along a little bit, and during the process of doing that, I would imagine that we'll be able to do the road similar. Because we have talked about that, and it is a good, it is a good plan. It does work very well down there. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Thank you again. And thank you for your thirty years. Okay. Now we're going to. Uh, Move over to the uh, select board. I'll go alphabetically. Uh, so that would mean Leanne Gonzalez would go first. Uh, we have an opportunity. Leanne is running for her second term. She uh, uh, has dedicated a, a lot of her time to give the best to the community that she she possibly can, and I thank her for that. So, without further ado, it's. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Leanne Gonzalez. Um, I guess I'll start also by talking a little about my background. Um, moved here in 93 and watched this town for a lot. Um, came here with my husband, had my daughter in 95, my son in 97. They went through the North Reading school system. Um, my daughter is now a state trooper, and my son is a rock and roll drummer. <laughs> it couldn't be any more different. <laughs> um, great place to, to raise our kids. I did a lot of volunteering in town. Um, Girl Scout troop with Irene Yule. Uh, we brought our girls all the way up through high school. Um, CCD teacher for both my kids every grade. I'm sure they were pretty sick of me. Um, and I also was on the Music Boosters. I believe John was on there for a short time while I was there. Um, so volunteering is just part of my nature. It's something I do and I, I like to give back. And um, my background, my career background is business. I owned a salon and I think I was 24 when I opened my first salon. 
I had five employees. I kept that until I moved here. I was commuting to Hull, <laughs> where I grew up. It was quite a commute. And when I had my daughter, I decided it was a little too much. So started working here in town, raised my kids. Um, when they got older, I got into more of a corporate salon. Um, they, it, I, I, yeah, it was Brooks people, let's we'll just say, you know, more corporate. Um, and then moved on to Newbridge on the Charles in Dedham and was managing that. Uh, five salons in there I was managing. Um, and then decided to get certified for memory care and Alzheimer's dementia training. And so now I run salons at Artists in Reading and in Lexington. So I'm now self-employed doing that. So I have a lot of business knowledge. Um, the reason I wanted to run on the board, my, my kids were older, uh, not that I have a lot of time. <laughs> Nobody on the board has a lot of time. <laughs> we're all very busy, but you make the time when you want to give back, you just make it. Um, when we were raising the kids, we had the opportunity to build a home. Um, we were already in a home and were able to build a home. I went before CPC, I went before Warren Pierce many times <laughs> back then. And it was just interesting to me. It just always stayed in my head, all the boards we went in front of and how it worked. And um, I just felt like a little nudge to, to be involved in that. So that's kind of what made me, part of what made me take that step. The first time I ran was with Mr. Walner and we both lost. <laughs> um, but it was two incumbents, so we didn't feel too bad. Um, and then ironically, we both decided to run again, what, six years later for the same seats? Was it three years later? Because it was the same seats, right? Yep. Same seats. Um, I, I never even talked about it, but we both stepped up and we both won so <laughs> and i just feel like i i thought about did i want to run again did i want to because it really is time consuming um we have such a camaraderie our board works so well together even with our very different ideas and our very different beliefs we're all very respectful of each other and we all work so well together that i felt like i didn't want to mess that I didn't want that to, to change, so I decided to continue on. So I hope that I will get to vote, even though I know I don't have anybody running against me, but it would still be nice to, to get your vote. And like Warren said, just to feel like you, know, you think that I'm doing a good job. So um, I hope that you'll give me that on May 3rd, did you say? <laughs> May 3rd, everybody. <laughs> So thank you. I'll, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Nothing. All right. They're all here for the selection. Right. <laughs> 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 okay. Great. So uh, next is uh, Rich Walner. I guess you now know his story because the aunt told you his story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, uh, at least that portion of it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I've worked with Rich, you know, on many different occasions. He's a passionate person about uh, North Reading. He, he has a vision for North Reading uh, and has some ideas. And I think uh, hopefully he'll be able to, excuse me, to share some of them uh, with you tonight. But uh, he loves North Reading. And, and, and if I, if I may say, I think everybody here loves North Reading, and that's why we're here. So I just want to uh, have you come and speak and let everybody know what you're thinking. So when you vote, uh, Leanne and I count up the votes after us to find out who got more. We do. It's yeah. a little competition. So. Uh, I think I won the last time, so if you give her more votes this time, I'll get rid of So we're all good. Um, a formal statement, then I'd love to take some questions. So uh, my name is Rich Walner, and I'm running for the second term on the select board because the board, along with the town administrator, have found productive ways to work together, and because I want to continue to bring forward ideas that will improve the quality of life for everyone in our town. Examples include improving access to the Swan Pond area, which is something we've been processed right now, 
improving Martin's Pond, which we uh, did a whole weed control just recently. And then uh, I'm sure some of you have heard we're proposing a recreational trail that has been in the works about the last five, six years, which would be a great amenity for our town that many people don't even know we already have a trail in the town that we just don't have access to. Um, I support social issues such as working with the Council of Aging, which I've done for 10 years. Uh, Commission on Disabilities, which is meeting right now in downtown. We have a whole new uh, uh, squad of people who are very enthusiastic. Uh, we're, we're reaching far and wide. We have a, we already have some um, uh, people from from the town already starting to attend. They're going to hear a lot more from us as we make progress. Uh, Tax aid committee is uh, has two warrants on the article. Um, it's, it's it's coming from the assessor's office, but it's also sourced through the tax aid committee to help our seniors stay in place and not leave and to take care of our vets as well. Um, I'm also, with, um, we're gonna be working on creating a transportation committee because one of the biggest things our seniors have as a problem in town is we don't have transportation uh, that they can use and we need to get better at doing that. So that's something we're working on. Um, I also support, uh, you know, while we're talking about the schools, I strongly support the need for diversity education in our schools because our kids want and need to be prepared for a world of many colors and uh, different types of people, as we saw so wonderfully expressed by our students in the transcript on March 31st. That those were compelling words that we should all pay attention to. Uh, here's a major concern. However, after 10 years of collaboration and study on this topic, our demographics are changing. We are one of the fastest growing communities of seniors in Massachusetts, yes, yet our seniors are being pushed out due to high property taxes lack of services, and lack of age-appropriate community gathering places. Why is it important to keep our seniors, why is it important to keep our seniors in town? Here is one fiscal reason. It takes the property taxes from two empty nesters' homes to pay the cost of sending just one child to our schools. So it takes three homes to send one child to school. One child can only live in one home. It takes the extra two homes to make us uh, let the kids go to school. That's how much it costs. Second, our seniors helped to create the town we enjoy so much today. We owe them our gratitude and support. Unfortunately, recent studies show that only 60% of our rising senior parents, and let me define what that means, parents whose kids are graduating and are becoming empty nesters themselves, only 60% of those rising senior parents intend to stay in town. This is an alarming stat because the state average is 80% and it's compelling indicator that we must take active steps now to give these rising seniors reasons to stay in our town or we risk decimating our schools and our community if they leave. And that can happen in the next 10 to 15 years. That's how close this is coming. Uh, the select board understands this and has already decided to fill a long vacant role of public services director to help lead the way, but there is so much more we need to do. That has been one of my primary focuses for the last 10 years. Um, other issues that are very important for the select board coming up is obviously the sewage. How are we going to pay for that? What's our return on investment? These are, you know, this is, this is going out many, many years that we're making decisions now that we have to uh, get our arms around and think through. And we have good people who are working on on the select board and facilities. We have a need to expand our uh, fire station and we have to do it in a economical way that will work. Uh, for everybody, and uh, we have other needs. You know, town hall is not looking so great. The shelves fall off the walls. You know, there's many issues, and I know that facilities master planning committee is working hard on that as well. So these are issues that um, you know it's going to come become come before the select board over the next three years. Um, I certainly have a voice, as everybody else does. And again, as Leanne said, we're working really well together. Um, I have a long resume. If you want to see it, it's on LinkedIn. I don't want to take up much time to do that, so I'm happy to give that to you later. If you want to learn more about BH Friendly, um, just go to the NORACAM Facebook page and, and just search on BH Friendly presentation, and I'll bore you for an hour and a half, but it's good information for you. I'd love to take some questions if you have. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, that after each group, we open it up to any questions. And so we have a select board, we have an opportunity to ask them questions. You just heard a lot information uh, there should be some questions here uh, yes oh my name is Rich Drive Rich Marshall um, yeah. I just have a question about um, you mentioned you're concerned about the senior population which 
12 members on it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're right behind you. <laughs> uh, I just wonder if there's any plans before the Board of Selectmen, um, select board, um, to develop another senior center, a new senior center. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, many years ago we defined that uh, there was there was going to be a, um, the senior center is what it is. And uh, uh, probably eight years ago we defined that we really needed to open up an intergenerational community center. And that would blend together parks and rec, vet services, um, youth services, and seniors all together in one building. Um, this is a successful model that should, if you go to Lexington, they have a, a wonderful model of that happening. They have like 20% of their population has signed up to do that. I've been in there and from nine to three, it's busy with seniors doing their thing. And then from three to nine, it's busy with the kids coming in as well. So there, there is a plan to do that. Um, there is a, uh, I think the popular choice right now is to build it in Epsilon River Park. And that's an active part of the facilities master planning committee. Um, I would probably, in a minority, want it somewhere else, but that's to be discussed later on. But there is a plan to do that. So let people ask. <coughs> Is there any other questions? Are there any questions, I should say? Yes, in the back? Yes, hi. Um, just a quick question as a rising senior myself. Um, it seems to me that one of the big issues for a lot of people aging in North Reading is, you know, you come here for the schools, the houses are all quite large. <laughs> So the two questions, so when people are in June, people are going to be sitting there watching their kids graduate, right? And they start asking the questions, um, you know, I've had this great connection with my community on the fields, with, the, with all the clubs, everything else like that. And they start asking the question, is there life after kids? And the second question they ask is, do I stay or do I go? Right? And they, they and right now we don't have a downtown, which is what CPC is, you know, hopefully going to be working on. We don't have places for people to overhouse. There's many people in seniors in town who are living on fixed income who are overhoused, who can't go anywhere else, and we have to give them anywhere to go. And that is something that, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the town master plan, which is covering the next two, 10 years, it's about housing. It's about creating a community center for adults that adults can enjoy. It's about, you know, having this intergenerational community center be a gathering point for people. We have to do more to reach out to the adults in town to keep them in town, but we're gonna lose them. And so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, but it's many cylinders to make this work. You know, there's been many, uh, you know, there's, it, it takes many aspects to make this all work. And I think we're all getting there. Uh, it's a long-term plan, but I think our goal is to, to make that happen and make the town wonderful for seniors as well. So thanks for asking. I just want to ask a, a, a quick point or question. When you say over housed, what do you mean by that? Uh, okay. So they're, they're, they're property rich in cash flow. Right? And, and uh, so we, we have to figure ways to reach out to them uh, and keep them in town. But a lot of people, just even maintaining a large home, there's a lot for them. But we haven't given them places to go where they can find a community center where it's walkable, where it's a, a friendly place for them to be. We need to we need to do that, and it's not this is not this is not radical thinking. It's being done in many many places in the country, in Massachusetts especially. Um, we have an opportunity to do it here. Actually, we have an opportunity because we don't have a downtown, so we can create one. And we have the space to do it. At least that's what I believe. Thank you, Thank you for that clarification. Yes. It is. It is. I can answer that one. <laughs> yeah. No, you. It's your. But I want.
wasn't sure if you were aware of yeah, that. Yeah, no, uh, So there is a, uh, out in uh, Stromstead, they did a combined senior center next to the high school. An attempt to do that has not, have, has not worked well. Um, there's rules about using the school. It's, um, you know, there's, there's issues of uh, paying for it, how you fund it, and everything else like that. So what I've heard doesn't mean we couldn't explore it, but um, that we really need to give a space for the intergenerational community center that's separate from the schools. Um, the, the only thing I add to that is I can experience <coughs> the communities I've lived in, and I'm just saying, you know, these times have changed and, you know, taxes, and, and so, again, I don't know what it is, but these were evening classes, anything from finances for senior citizens to wine tasting to um, art classes, and they were volunteers. Three things that seniors want to be happy in their communities. They want to live in their house as long as they can. They want to live in their community as long as they can. And they want to lead a life of purpose. Now in Western Mass, there's this thing called the treehouse. And what they have is when the kids get out of school, it's kind of like a, a boys and girls club. They they have seniors waiting for them to, to work with them and to, to do tutoring and do things like that. And this is, we have this great opportunity. And the success rate of that is off the charts. Everybody's happy because the seniors are happy to help the kids. The parents are happy because they're getting into tutoring after school. Right, and I, and I can understand that because you have, I think, both. Right? Yeah, you right. can have both. So we Absolutely. have a beautiful school that, again, I, 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 I hear from neighbors who are elderly and they're like, well, Public services director, one of their main things is to pull together all these different departments, library, parks and rec, all these people, but also to make a safe money. And that's a good thing. Do we have any additional questions? Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I haven't been attending as many select board meetings as I would like to. I'm curious on your take on um, the art funds. What the plan is for the money that's coming into the town? What, what are the best uses for those? Potential to uh, put in, you know, we have electric cars. I have an electric car. Um, we need chargers, and so it'd be nice to start setting up chargers in town where people can start to do these sort of things. So we're thinking a little bit out of the box to use that money in ways that will bring us up to the next uh, century, I guess. Um, and there's other things with that, but it's really not well defined at this point. But it's a wish list at this point. It's a wish list. It's a wish list. But we're thinking about it, so thanks for asking. Yes? Is that it?
school for COVID. So it's part of it's, the overall. It's COVID, it's COVID but it's not school related. Okay. So ARP is the part of it that's not school. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes? I do have a question for Lena. Um, so there was something recently that we have different months for everything we celebrate. There's something for the veterans and first responders. I don't think a lot of people know about it. Yeah, well, thank you for asking. Um, yes, I did bring forward. Can you, um, can you? Oh, she asked if there was um, any, there are, there are months that are given to a proclamation for, um, like there's the Pride Day month. Um, and I brought forward, she said, was there anything for the veterans? So, yes, I had brought forward a, pro a proclamation for the veterans. October is now Veterans Month in North Reading every year. Um, we have Pride Month. Thank you. Pride Month was brought forward, I believe. June. Yeah, so that was your right. Um, for uh, June. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for a team. Yeah, I don't to do that. Um, and yeah, I am actually working on first responders because I don't think they should be allowed that. Um, yeah, so. Okay, that's a good exchange of uh, uh, communication and ideas and uh, to hear that, uh, what's going on in the community. I thank you both. Thank you. And good luck. I thank hope you, you win. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, now we're up to the school committee. And I was, I was going to ask them to decide who they wanted to go first and so on, but everyone was so busy socializing that it never got to happen. So I'm going to have to go alphabetically, okay? And hopefully I know my alphabet. So, <laughs> but that would mean that, that uh, Jody, uh, uh, alphabetically by the last name, um, the Jody uh, Coney would uh, go first, if you're all set. Yes, into action. I have written policies that have created a positive impact on my workplaces, 
I have been part of union negotiations, hiring, re reviews, and disciplinary processes. I want to use these skills to make North Reading school systems a better place for all of our kids. I think all this experience makes me qualified for the job of being a member of the school committee. I think what separates me from some of the other candidates is that I've attended most of the school committee meetings in the entirety of the year since I went last year. I have done advocacy work inside our town and outside for eight years. I attended my first IEP meeting for my son about 11 years ago. I have both supported and disagreed with the school administration. I have done that while building strong relationships founded on respect, while creating an environment where members of the staff and administrative administration have reached out to me for my opinion in making policy decisions surrounding uh, my advocacy work. I am committed to using all these skills and experience to build the strongest possible future for all of our kids. would be Jeffrey Friedman.
people watching. From oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just think I want them to be able to hear you. I, I naturally told them too loud, so that's like the first time. You ever. have a live studio. I audience. know, right? Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday Night Live will not be calm. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I was saying is that the, the role of hiring the superintendent doesn't stop at the at the edge of okay, the person's hired and that's it. There's an oversight. Uh, there's an oversight role here as well. It's making sure that the three and five year goals that the superintendent comes in with, and, and that contract has actually been renewed for another, another several years, uh, making sure those goals are being met. Making sure we're on track. Are there gaps? What, what works to actually fill those gaps? We obviously work on budget, and the budget impacts very practical things when it comes to our kids' education, classroom sizes. It, it, it impacts the number of uh, activities that get offered. What are the fees that, uh, that are associated with it? What is the cost of a uh, full day kindergarten, which the, the town did a good job of, of actually reducing. But it's, it's all of those practical things that go into it that actually small decisions become bigger decisions that all of which have practical impact to our kids. And, and the thing I'm actually gonna, gonna leave on is, is really, we've talked about it in, in past discussions about well, how do we get great teachers and how do we keep great teachers? And how do, we, how do we make sure that we can find a diverse set of teachers as well? And to me, it all comes down to a very practical answer. And, and it's really, how do, we, how do we stop teachers going to other school districts? How do we stop a middle school science teacher from going to a, a nearby school district because they're getting more pay? It really comes down to two things. From my experience, it's making sure there's a contract that is advantageous to the teachers. And again, we've done a very good job of that in the past, uh, of trying to bring them up to what the other communities are paying. If you offer a competitive pay, people aren't gonna leave because they're, they're getting paid more elsewhere. So making sure that the steps and the, the eventual uh, pay is really on par with, with other districts. You've gotta keep that going. It's not just a one-time contract. The other thing is, once they're here, if you want to keep them here, if you want to attract the, the best people, you give them the right resources, and more importantly, you get out of their way. You let them do what they do best. Teachers, from my experience, having married an educator, uh, and having known several, but I mean, uh, other people I'm sure have great experiences too, will tell you, they don't enter the job thinking, wow, I hope I get micromanaged. Do any of us do any job thinking we're gonna get micromanaged and, and get joy out of that? They do the job because they know they can do it and they know they are motivated for it. So let them do their jobs. And that's really part of our role is to make sure they have the resources to be able to do that without our interference in their day-to-day -day classroom, but yet have the things they need to successfully accomplish their job. So with that, I will, I will close by saying, uh, it's not my quote, but uh, I'll steal it anyway, saying, uh, Decisions are made by those who participate. Please come out and vote on May 3rd. Uh, please use all your votes. <laughs> there are two votes for, for school committee. Please use both of them because it is important and because we do feel it's important. So thank you. Okay, next is uh, Kristen O'Mara. Oh, hi, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, now. Other people need a hug. Okay, perfect. Um, so, hi, my name is, well, first off, thank you to everyone that um, came here and everyone um, listening at home and taking the time to do that as well. Uh, my name is Kristen O'Mara, and I am running for all of the children of our community. All North Reading's children deserve a top-notch education that will prepare them for the complex, technical, and competitive world that awaits them. I want our schools to continue to be a safe and nurturing place where students can respect one another and become strong, independent, critical thinkers. The curriculum should support mathematics, writing, reading, history, um, STEM integration, physical education, art, and music. My husband and I moved to North Reading 10 years ago because we wanted to be a part of a community that had a highly ranked school system, knowing we would grow our family here. I'm a proud mother of two sons. Tyler is in the second grade at the low school, and Zachary is in preschool at the Hood Elementary School. 
the COVID pandemic closed our schools and forced parents to participate in our children's <coughs> education. In collaboration with a few other first grade parents, we decided to create a pod learning environment where we helped deliver the daily lesson plans and create a fun environment where our children could socialize and be excited to learn. This is an example of the level of commitment I would give as a school committee member to bring our faculty, students, parents, and community members together to ensure excellence in student achievement. This experience opened my eyes to how important it is to help support and preserve our public education. A little bit about my background, I attended UMass Dartmouth and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Human Resource Management and Finance. After graduating college, I worked at Children's Hospital Boston and enjoyed being part of a team that made a difference in many lives. I furthered my career into the retail banking industry where I became an effective branch manager for many years. These experiences have strengthened my leadership and financial skills that I can apply to challenges and offer problem solving strategies to meet the needs of the teachers, the administration, students, school budgets, and also school district goals. I have been involved with the Little School PTO since Tyler started kindergarten. I am the treasurer on their board and I am committed to accuracy, transparency, and timeliness to maintain the finances and set the budget. Education is one of our most important community investments and our school committee's actions affect our town's reputation. Our children need us and they need our support to foster their growth into becoming creative, responsible, knowledge, and kind individuals who are prepared to face today's ever-changing world. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have Noel Rutherford. Collaborator. 
and a bridge builder. Uh, I can listen to people voice their opinions and concerns with empathy and move everyone towards uh, logical and fact-based conclusions. Um, I'm diplomatic. Uh, John's no longer here, but he spoke of being Switzerland as moderator. I like to think of myself in Switzerland, <laughs> Switzerland in a lot of ways, too. Um, I do not feel that um, national politics belong <coughs> in small town business, um, especially on a school committee. Um, I feel really strongly about engaging stakeholders, whether they be students, families, teachers, um, and the administration, and, and working together to collaborate with them. Um, as I mentioned before, I have worked um, in uh, grant-funded projects in the past, so I have experience with managing budgets within a um, pretty small um, limit and working creatively with budgets um, and using limited funds. Um, also, um, a note about the budget and um, what Rich Walner, is Rich still here? There you go. Um, what Rich Walner was speaking of earlier um, and the importance of being cognizant of the fact that we are, the school budget is funded by taxpayers and a lot of um, which are um, taxpayers who no longer have children in the schools. Um, in my work, in my research work, I did a lot of um, different um, focus groups and qualitative research at different councils on aging across the state and um, one of my passions is actually um, geriatrics and working with older adults. So I do think that as a school committee member, even though I'm working for the schools with kids, I think it's important to be cognizant of the um, fact that we are using taxpayer money and that um, it's, a, it's a big budget that we're operating and always to be mindful of, of the people that are really working hard to stay in North Reading, the older adults. Sorry, I'm going to pick up my mom again, but she's she's wanting to stay in North Reading, and it's tough. It's, as we all know, the tax rate's high, so I think that's important to be mindful of that, um, even you know as a school committee member. Um, anyhow, uh, a, a little bit more about why I decided to run. Um, it's been a really tough few years. I'm so happy um, and grateful to move on, and that the, the pandemic is in our rearview mirror. I really want to help us move on from that, from a lot of, our kids went through a lot. Um, they need to recover academically, um, emotionally, um, and we need to move on. Um, I'm very passionate about education, about maintaining really strict academic standards, merit-based education, um, and encouraging healthy discourse and debate. Um, I believe in a strong classic foundation to education, including literature, science, history, civics, critical thinking, um, and I'm also very passionate about supporting the arts as well. Um, so again, I would think of myself as a bridge builder. I would like to model and encourage an environment of resilience and unity and help the students of North Reading to create a common culture where they are seen and valued and feel as um, feel they are an essential member of the uh, of the student body. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, committee uh, candidates, school committee candidates, would you please uh, come to the uh, podium? Are you awesome. Yeah, all of you. Yep, all of you. I'm assuming there are going to be questions, and that's why I'm sure. um, I have you up here. Uh, one second. I just want to make a, a point of clarification. Uh, Come the uh, May third election, uh, uh, John Barrett has uh, decided not to run. I don't know if people are aware of that, but he's decided not to run to a school committee. And but he will be on the. I, I, that's what I'm getting to. Okay, uh, uh, he will be on the ballot though. Okay, so just to let you know, but he did the. I, uh, did, I spoke with the uh, town clerk, and she did inform me. Accordingly, so I just just wanted to let you know that, okay. And, and and if you and if you do vote for him, then that won't uh, because he's already said uh, notify the town clerk that he's not running. That that vote would not be uh, counted, and 
if he were to win, then that seat would not be filled. And if that seat's not filled, I believe that would fall into the hands of the select board at that point. Okay, that's based on my conversation with the town clerk. So, um, That's not what, okay, then this cost, that's so what I, she I told me. I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm the person that actually went to the town yeah. and I talked well, to her. Well, I did too. I spoke to her one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so we're getting conflicting yeah, information, yeah. 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 Well, that's, what she, that's the way she explained it to me. Can I just yes. say one thing? Go ahead. So, I went down there yesterday morning. And I, oh, close to the sorry. Oh, and I wanted, and I asked to see, because it's public knowledge, if John submitted a written request and he, there none exists as of yesterday but it doesn't matter because he didn't submit it before the deadline the deadline was march 31st and he did not submit it then so he can say whatever he wants to say but he will still be on the ballot and he if he has the votes if he's the first the highest and the second highest he will still be able to go on the school committee if he chooses to do so and she did tell me that to my face and i'm not trying to call him a liar but that is actual facts <laughs> What if he declines? So if he wants to decline, I'm pretty sure I looked it up, there's a law that supports this. And it says if you have six consecutive days to write a written letter, sign it, get it notarized, and pass it into the town clerk. Now I think the school committee does have an issue, can do something maybe with, I don't know, I've heard something about, I don't know, There's some, I maybe I'll ask Scott Buckley to ask. I, I, think, I think it's a, if he declines, I believe it's a joint selection of the select board and the school committee. Yes. Yes. So there was some confusing information there. Um, uh, so, do I have any questions for the school candidates? Now, this is Q and A, question and answer. Ask and listen. I see a wild hand going up. So I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I do have a question. I have, I, have, I have two questions. I was just kidding. That's what I do when I want to talk. I have, I have two questions for, for each of the candidates. Um, please. There's two separate questions. And I, my, my first question is, and they're pretty much pretty similar. I, I would like to hear each candidate's position on, and if elected, what actions they would take involving <coughs> curriculum choices at our schools. And the second question is I would like to hear what each candidate's position is on what books we have in our school libraries, all of our school libraries, and if elected, what you would be doing, what actions each of the candidates would be doing in terms of either censoring, removal, or otherwise with regard to library books that are available for our students. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> How much time have you got? Um, so the, the first thing, the first question is specific curriculum. Uh, in, in my opinion, the, the and my answers can be similar to both. Uh, in my opinion, the school board should not be making specific curriculum decisions. So um, something, something that I, I mean, I would love to be an AP English teacher. I would love that. That would be awesome. Um, but for me, I am A, not qualified, and B, it's not the job that I'm being hired for. If you go back and even look at the, the minutes from the last year of meetings, to my knowledge, there's never been a vote on a specific book or curriculum choice in, in a classroom. And, and I'll go a little further in that in saying, I, I don't think you want us to do that. It's this very slippery slope very quickly. For me to say, my daughter doesn't like long division, say goodbye to long division, Newtonian physics. I mean, we're talking about it in the context of, of diversity and, and more flashpoint issues, but it, there's no limit to that. There's no law that says we talk about, we can enter curriculum on some topics, but not others. So what's to prevent me from saying goodbye evolution, <laughs> you know, goodbye history of colonialism in, uh, in Europe? So for me, pretty obviously, I, I don't think that's where we get involved, in my opinion. Um, second thing is, same thing on books. You know, I, I don't think there should be up or down votes on which books. Obviously, if there's specific issues on specific books that violate something else in state law or federal law, someone should bring it forward.
but that's really the principal, or it's the superintendent that really would oversee that first, again, my opinion, but we shouldn't be up or down voting specific books. So I'll, I'll leave it there after that long-winded answer, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want us to all do curriculum and then, mm -hmm. or, oh, books, I guess, first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so first off, you want to answer? Um, this board report? Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, being part of the committee is, um, you know, it, it's about um, consensus building. You know, each of us is just one member if we were to get on of the, you know, multiple member committee. And um, my, I mean, for a curriculum, again, like to Jeff, I'm not a teacher. That's not, I listed what I've done in my past and that is not it. Um, I mean, I do want our kids to be, but I hope the curriculum would support reading, teaching kids how to read and write and math. Um, we want our kids to be smart, I believe, when they get out. Um, so as far as like my opinion, that's, that's my opinion on that. Um, I think they should definitely learn about the history and what's happened. Um, we can't, we shouldn't be, um, you know, our past of the history of our America is what it is, and I think everyone should learn about that um, in age appropriate. Um, but I definitely don't think that as a school committee member, we have, I don't think it's even in the role for us to pick and choose the curriculum. Um, I think, again, it's more like Jeff said, if there's a particular issue, something that like a student, a teacher, a parent, we all maybe could all fit together and talk about it if there's a problem and collaborate with administration um, to solve that problem and work how we can make changes um, for that. But it's definitely not something that I think we can just decide on our own for. Um, and then books is kind of the same thing. I mean, I sadly, I haven't probably been in the library in a long time. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, I probably should, though. And I know Katie is at the library, so I should probably go visit her and do that. That's on the list. Um, so I mean, as far as, again, I think it's the library is the same thing. If someone has a problem and they can bring it forward to us and feel comfortable in that space, and again, that, you know, for the whole committee and work with the administration, and, Go from there, but um, I I wouldn't go picking books out. I guess. <laughs> Hi there. Okay, so to start with curriculum, um, first off, I would say that I um, have a great deal of faith in our teachers and our administration. Um, I've said before that every year I think that I couldn't get luckier with the teachers that I have gotten or my kids have gotten, but, um, and it, I'm, I've been proved wrong many times. So we have amazing teachers and they are light years above what I, what I could do in terms of teaching. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I also, with the administration, I was lucky enough to have my kids start at The Batch under um, Sean Colleen, who's now um, moved on to administration um, for the whole district. And I was so, I was sad to see him go, but I was really grateful that, that I'm, my kids are gonna have his influence all the way through high school because I have a lot of trust in um, Dr. Daly and Mr. Colleen. And I, I do think that their job is their educators. Now, in terms of curriculum choice, certainly I, I think it's interesting that, to be apprised of it um, and to review it but it's not my place to choose or select. Um, and same, same thing with, with, with books. Um, I think that literature is so very important for teaching us lessons um, from, from a current time, um, historical, I mean, it is deeply important. Um, you know, um, one of my um, friends here was speaking about how, um, you know, you teach history with the warts included. There's a lot of literature that has the warts included, and I don't think that that should be limited or taken away. Um, if there was something specific that was inappropriate, um, or somehow, um, especially age inappropriate, I mean, I have young kids, so I mean, that's sort of, I'm thinking of that in some way, then that I believe would be brought up to the superintendent and us as, as the school committee to review, but I would certainly never never condone going after specific books unless there was a specific issue. Um, books are my one of my greatest loves, so I don't want to go after books. <laughs> um, sure, thanks. Um, 
I think that we've touched on a lot of good points. So, um, but I think my opinion is that the role that school committee plays in curriculum is in funding curriculum. Um, I think that a lot of times that, you know, if we want there to see changes like updated and how we're teaching different subjects, that's where we come in. It's not selecting the exact curriculum, but saying like we will support this being updated to reflect whatever new things are coming up in all different kinds of, in science, in mathematics, in you know civics, whatever is happening, we need to make sure that there's budget for the kids to have a as current as possible um, curriculum. And I think that's where the role the school committee plays in curriculum, not necessarily selecting it, but making sure teachers have access to the best curriculum to teach um, students the most up-to-date information that is available. In terms of books, I think books are awesome, and I am a huge fan, and I think that, you know, um, you know, my kids take books out of the library, and at, at, at the middle school, well, mostly my daughter, my son would not choose to read a book for fun, but my daughter loves reading, and she's read about a million different things, and I think that it's important that kids have access to books that make them think about things differently, make them question things, have conversations with their parents, do all of those things. So I think it's super important that they have the ability to read about things that they are seeing in their world. And, and it helps them you know, formulate ideas about it and to think critically. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to have a say in everything that she read because I want her to hear other people's viewpoints in all the ways that she possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 yes, in the back. So um, I'm John Slang, and um, I'm kind of here as part of his constituency. And what I'm hearing is, I think, a miscommunication, probably should be on his part, that, um, and, I, and I heard um, on social media and, and things that he's for book burning and um, censorship of libraries, and that is not what he's looking for. What he's looking for is transparency, so parents can have conversations <coughs> with their kids. And as one of the candidates, um, I think it was Noel, that if, if it's, you feel it's age inappropriate for your child, that you have the ability to know what is in the library, what is being in the classroom, you know, these are, sometimes we're talking about young kids in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. We may not have that in our school system, but when we have asked for the card, you know, what's in the library, we've had a hands up, but we're not gonna tell you. So that to me is a red flag, because parents who have supported John, and why I'm here, because they're like, well, who are we going to support? And it's that transparency in the school system because they know other schools I'm sorry uh, I, I just wanted to make sure do you have a question yeah. well all right so my question is yes because I'm I, this is kind of a bridge over kind of what Katie had said and and what, what's being said here is um, because I want to set the kind of the record straight right so this isn't about uh, or I'll tell you my question um, it's, it's a two-part yes or no um, do you feel parents have the right, parents have the right to know what is being specifically taught in schools and have easy access to books and curriculum, including what's in the libraries, not, mind you, as many would have you believe, for book banning or censorship, but to assure balance and the ability for parents to have conversations with their children. You all mentioned that. To assure, assure age appropriateness for books and curriculum. And secondly, do parents have the right to opt out for instruction and programs that they find offensive or objectionable or feel is inappropriate based on age or against their faith or moral values? And we have young kids in the system, and we may not yeah, have to hear like other to hear her. systems that have that we know in Massachusetts. And so parents just want to have transparency so they can have conversations with their kids. So, so 
your, your question is Do you feel that parents, that, that parents have a right to transparency and to know what's being taught in the schools and to be able to opt out if they find it objectionable based on faith, age of inappropriateness, moral or ethical values. Okay. Thank you. And, and I can add to this that we are a room of mixed people and yet I'm friends with a lot of people here on different ends of the spectrum. And I think we need to be able to, to acknowledge that we're all different and allow that the school should be raising our kids. We should and let them have a I wanted to answer your question. Okay, right. you have two okay. questions I wanted to answer. Yeah. start with you. Sure. Respectfully, I'm not going to answer yes or no because that was like a 45 minute question. So, uh, so here's the thing. Here's what I. Here's what, as am I, and I'm never going to fault you for your passion. Here's here's what I think about these topics. Okay, um, a couple of things. One, we can't say we want to get out of teachers' ways or that we trust our teachers, except for on the things that I know I'm smarter than them on. That isn't a way to run a school committee. That isn't what I think any of us should do. I think that, no, I think that we have to say that we trust our educators to be teaching our kids age appropriate things. We trust our librarians to make sure that those books are appropriate. Faith is a big part of my life. It is not something that I don't understand or that I don't support, but it doesn't mean your that your kid if they that they should not hear about other viewpoints. And if they're not, you know, I heard you say you, we should be raising our kids. We should be raising our own kids, and I 100% agree with you. But what where I differ is, I think we should make. And our home environment, a place where the kid reads something that they don't think matches my values, they come to me and say that, and not that I stop them from reading it. I, I just want to make sure that the, the, the question really is uh, whether the parents have a right to know, to have transparency in the school of what's being taught. That's pretty much what the question is. Great. Right, so Okay. So we can have a conversation right. with our Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, no problem. Okay, so um, I'm gonna try to answer this. My uh, my brain is like playing catch up still. Um, in terms of curriculum, I believe, and again, um, excuse my naivete, um, very often at the beginning of a semester or a or a year, you do get an overview of the curriculum that your teacher is going to be teaching you know yeah we're, we're gonna or, or yeah the student handbook, handbook is a little different but you know the overview of okay we're going to do a unit on this we're going to do a unit on that um we're going to be reading this book and it's going to launch into our discussion of x i that's what i've received so far i've only been in the process for the first few years so absolutely as you're going to the back to school nights you should be hearing what they're going to teach are you going to hear everything Probably not, um, but I, as I said before, I have a great deal of trust in the administration and the teachers to um, to really choose the tools that are going to be best suited for the kids. That being said, if there was something that I had a question about, I feel that I have the right, and I feel like every teacher that I've interacted with is very responsive to a discussion about you know, I need a little extra help understanding how am I going to teach? Again, I have young kids, so maybe it's not, we're not getting into such controversial things, but, um, you know, how, I, need, I need help in explaining this. Like, can you please explain and you read the math to me so I can understand it at home? That type of thing. Um, and the teachers have always been very perceptive to that. Um, okay, so I think that answers some of the curriculum question. What was the last one? I forget. Oh, opt out, opt out. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, that's a tough question. Um, again, I do think that there are um, things posed to kids for a reason. Um, I do think, again, we need to have, I do like the word transparency. We need to be able to talk to our kids about what they're being taught. 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean some sort of a divisive conversation. I don't see that at all. Um, I just, um, I, you know, I, I would like to be able to discuss things with, with um, you know, teachers and things like that. In terms of opting out, um, oh goodness, um, I just, I just don't see unless something is especially maybe going against someone's religious values or something. I just, I, I don't see a situation where opting out is necessarily appropriate, but. I'm, you know, please give me the grace to someday maybe change my opinion on that. But I don't, I don't necessarily think. Again, I have a lot of trust in the teachers and in the, in the administration um, and what they're what they're aiming to do. So I hope that answers. <laughs> I think I'm going to start backwards and go with opt out because that's fresh in the brain. Um, the one thing I I feel with opt out they could do. Be bad would be as a child that felt left out if they were removed from a certain subject and then how do they feel they're not working with their classmates I mean if they had that option I just think that's something to consider as well um, I mean my kids are really young preschool and second grade and most of my oldest is school has been primarily at home with me so um, I mean, I think there should be transparency for sure. I think parents, um, you know, you, you have your children, they're your child until they're 18. And I think that um, they should be able to talk to the teacher um, if they feel something's different. Um, but it's definitely hard for any school committee member or any, I mean, anyone of us, or any school committee member to be in the classroom, obviously, all the time. Um, you know, I think it's definitely it's just a conversation that needs to be had amongst everyone um, that's involved. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I answered that correctly or not. Okay. All good. So I'll give you a short answer, long answer. Uh, short answer is yes and no. Um, first answer, yes, as in transparency, is is obviously important. I think if anybody. <laughs> Uh, if anybody doesn't think that that getting some sort of transparency from from uh, the school is important, then that's that's fine. For me and, and our family, we like to preview things with our daughter. We like to we like to talk about things with with our family and find out what's going on. We've never had an issue with that. Um, I'm not sure if that has been an ongoing issue, um, and maybe it is, but but certainly we haven't seen it. But transparency, I'm not going to get the the legal elements of it. I don't consider myself a legal expert on 20 USC 1232H uh, or any, any of the others that I've, I've been recently reading about. Um, yeah, there, there is law out there about some of this, but again, I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert on that. The second piece of it uh, is where I want to focus a little bit more on the opt-out and my answer is no. Um, and I want to come back to the role of school committee. It's I, I can't imagine First level is a practical sense of who would be the arbiter of appropriateness. Uh, would, certainly, I, I can't imagine the five of us uh, or whoever's on voting saying this would be appropriate, that wouldn't. That would be, I mean, I, I can't imagine myself qualified in any sense to do that. Then I'm not really sure we want me to do that. Um, the, the second piece of it, though, is again, we talk about opting in and opting out and the, the moral elements of it, like there's a single issue that would do that, like a single book or a single subject against slippery slope. I, I have a moral objection to Newtonian physics. S equals 1 half ET squared is gone. I just, I, it, it's absurd to think that, but there's no control over it. There's no governing law. There's nothing that I've ever read or seen that would say school committee can opt govern opting in or out of specific topics. Uh, I just can't imagine having that level of control. I'd like to be the only potential, uh, the only uh, candidate for, for elected office to say, don't give me that power. I don't want that much power. Because uh, I can't imagine what I would do with it. Uh, but that's that's my answer, the short yes and no. Yes, I think all of these points are really great, and I. But I do want to add to the opting out piece. Um, 
for me, the reason that we shouldn't be able to opt out isn't because I'm not qualified. I'm not, but, but that isn't the reason. The reason is because you can opt out your kid from curriculum that you find upsetting, but that your kid, like we, we opt a kid out of a book that has LGBTQ people in it because that's not what we morally believe, doesn't stop your kid from being LGBTQ. It makes your kid feel less comfortable, right? If you block, if you block other students out of history because you think that the narrative in that history book isn't making, for whatever reason, if we're pulling kids from those classes because we don't think that's the right version of history to teach our children, then we are not giving our children a complete, like you're, we have to say we know, or the school knows what's best to teach our kids. And we have to support these kids having access to a full and complete curriculum. That's why it's important to say, no, you should not be allowed to opt your kids out of a full and complete educational experience because that's what they're entitled to um, as at a public education. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes? choosing the curriculum that's really the question right teaching and 
they find those individual styles effective. But the overall curriculum, in other words, the MCAS that they're teaching to, is all the same. You know, I, I as a parent, I, I will say, you know, cursive writing, really? I mean, I mean, that's my personal feeling, but yet I also know that is part of the curriculum. Um, and my job as a parent to advocate and say, wow, do I really want that going, doesn't impact whether or not that's actually part of the curriculum, because it is. Um, and, you know, that, that really is top down and something that if, if we really get a movement and you want to change something, that's the way to change it. But the classroom, there's an independent style, but curriculum really comes exactly as they're saying, DESE to superintendent, assistant superintendent, down through the schools. And does DESE get it from the Department of Education? You know, I, we can be, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, I think where you're going with this is, I, I think where you're going with this is, is at least what I'm hearing is partly like Common Core, that sort of thing. I mean, yeah, there, there are parts of that as well. Uh, there are, again, having done a little bit of, just a tiny bit of, of research on this, there are federal laws on, on these sorts of things, sure. Um, but states, from again, from what my knowledge of it, seem to have pretty good bit of freedom in that too, where they can't do anything they want. You're not gonna see one state go wildly off and say, you know, we're forget that, we're not gonna we're not gonna teach anything having to do with what any of the other states are doing. But I don't think you want that. I don't I don't I think what we're all advocating for is something similar and there's we all want to standardize uh, education. We all want our kids to have a great standardized education, public education, and to go beyond that, you're starting to think, okay, if that's not the route to go, maybe, maybe you know, I'm not advocating private school, I'm not advocating homeschooling, but if you're looking at something so radical, that is the departure. It was my opinion. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't mean to imply that. I, I, sorry about that. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. I just wanted to add. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying it's the, it's the same thing. Yeah. 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 Y
that um, I there are a lot of fees, especially I know that some of my um, fellow candidates haven't bumped into as many of them at the elementary and school level, but the middle school slash high school level, there is an enormous amount of fees that go into um, every number of things. Um, and I think that I would love us to see, to see us have no fees. That's like my goal. Um, given that that's not probably immediately possible, what I would like us to do as a first step is to build back in some respect and dignity for people who want to participate in things but can't afford them. Currently, there is no easy out option. You can't, if you don't pay a sports fee, which has happened to me in the past because I'm not always as timely about things as possible, you get an email that says, you didn't pay your sports fee, your kid can't play sports, unless you pay your sports fee. You don't get a friendly little notice that says, hey, if this is a hardship for you, let us know because we want your kid to play sports. No matter what, we just, you just get an increasing level of, um, you know, we have, it's amazing that all of our kids have Chromebooks now in school, but you, we want parents to spend $70 buying an insurance policy to cover that Chromebook. That is a, a nothing expenditure for every family. But now it's not like I can say, well, I don't want my kid to have a Chromebook. We're requiring parents to pay for that $70 insurance fee where, you know, all of the clubs, all of the drama, all of the, you know, essentially everything at the high school level besides math, um, English, and those things has a fee. So I think the, it's the most important first step towards us eliminating fees because regardless of what we say, having a fee makes it so that less kids access those things. There's just no way to pretend that it doesn't limit access. So the first step is to make it as as easy as possible and for people who need assistance to just get that assistance rather than making them come to whoever is the supreme ruler of the assistance and say cat and hand i can't afford this but i want my kids to participate Okay, so the user fees I know are a big, a big question and a big, you know, issue. And I have looked at them and see that they would add up very quickly. Um, obviously, um, the fees are there for a reason. This stuff is expensive. The, you know, all of the, the, the programs, whether they're arts or sports or whatnot. Um, and I do understand that there's programs in place to help alleviate that. But I do agree with Jody that it should be something that is not an intimidating process. I, I honestly have to say I don't know what the process is, but I would I would think that um, like we, we would do, um, again, I'm gonna use the batch as an example, is, is um, have an involvement with guidance or something like that. So you have maybe a system that someone can apply for or kind of um, anonymously, not anonymously, but without without anyone um, feeling embarrassed or anything like that, um, would be able to request aid. Because I, I mean, I do also think that we live in a really generous community and that there are people that have kids that play sports that would be happy to you know, contribute to boosters and things like that. So I do think the funding is there, but there needs to be a system. Um, and I, again, I apologize, I don't know what the current way of, of reaching out for aid is. Like I know sometimes it's if, if someone is uh, avail um, eligible for like a reduced lunch program, but um, of course because there's there's there should be no barriers between a child a student wanting to participate in an activity and actually being able to do it. Um, so I'm gonna. I do think that um, for people that can't. Um, there should be like an equation, I would imagine. Um, and I, like she said, fee reduced lunch is the only kind of fee I've really been privy to. Um, but with the user fees for athletics, um, they're put in place um, clearly probably for many years. Um, and you know, if people can't afford them, I would imagine there'd have to be like an equation of qualification for that. Um, on the other side of it, you know, for adults, if we're if we want to go to the gym, we pay a gym membership. Um, it's not free for everyone. There's that. Um, I do know in taxes, everyone 
household pays different amount of taxes and we're all getting the same education. So there's that that plays into it too. Um, just thinking outside the box. So I do think fees help pay for the activity that's happening. I definitely don't think it should be, you know, only the kids that can afford it, that can play it. There should be help for um, those kids that couldn't have it happen on their own and with the funding and fundraisers. But I mean, there definitely needs, someone needs to be paying also for, or help pay for all of these extracurricular activities that we're offering and other things that are going on in school. We're talking about means testing. <laughs> um, it, it, it does make some sense. Uh, I mean, if you can afford to pay, uh, that's great. And if you can't, then, then having some opportunity to still participate. I, I'm a huge fan, as I've spoken in the past, that Tom's spoken in the past, uh, about having opportunity and inclusion for, for mm -hmm. activities. Uh, my daughter swims and skates and plays soccer and likes theater and wants to learn how to play an instrument and an instrument. Um, I, I will say when I, believe it or not, I actually played sports, I may not look like it. Um, a long time ago, we did actually have fees. Um, and even back then, I, I thought it was odd, but obviously there are expenses that go in, into these. And there are hard choices that have to be that have to be made when you think about a budget. Pay for pay for user fees, have another adjustment counselor, or do we reduce the cost of kindergarten, which is also in, about inclusion? Um, I, I actually don't mind the concept of uh, of means testing. Uh, I think it would have to be really it, it's much more complicated than, and I don't, I don't think anybody's oversimplifying it. Um, I, I think it's a little more complicated than just doing that, but I, I certainly think it, it could be worth a look if, assuming, you know, that's something that's been done in other towns. I would look to others for guidance on that. You know, look to see where what other towns have done for inclusion, um, and see what a is permissible and b because, you know, it, it's not as simple as just saying what is a means test um, to make sure it's fair. So I, I would look to see what other towns have done for that sort of thing, um, but. It, these are very difficult decisions because money from one place come, uh, is valuable uh, to someone else or to something else. So, uh, anyway, thank you. Great question. That was a, a very, very key question to be asking because there are a lot of children in North Reading who cannot afford to play in sports. And it's the have versus the have nots kind of scenario. And then you have the issue of, well, we include all the sports and all the theater into the, into the cost of education, then the taxpayers have to figure out who is going to pay for that. So uh, it's a very tough uh, uh, issue to, to solve. Uh, but hopefully, you guys will do that. <laughs> so, uh, but is there any, I'm gonna take one more question because we're getting kind of late. Uh, yes? So we need at least one COVID question, right? Um, and hopefully it'll be a short one. It, it, it should be a yes or no, maybe. So, um, so fortunately and very happily, the pandemic is winding down. We have still have variants, but they get less and less virulent. I know that um, Dr. Daly has expressed a desire to have vaccines at an eighty percent rate across the district. So, I'd like to know you how you feel about that. The second question, though, it's related is if now we're relaxing with the uh, masks, so it's nice to see everybody's faces today. Um, but great. how do you feel about if, if we start getting another variant, like something like AB2 or AB3, right? How do you feel about reimposing the mask mandate? Should they be mandated or optional at every grade level? I'm not just, I'm talking preschool to 12th grade. And how do each of you feel about that? So that would be throughout the system. Throughout the system, right. yeah. So, so two, two points, how do I feel about the, the 80% uh, as a guideline? Um, I, I will say to encourage people to, to get vaccinated is great. Is it mandated? Is it, should it be mandated that 80% of the town get that? I think that's a different discussion that we will have no control over whatsoever. Not the town, uh, the schools. The, well, the schools. Yeah. Uh, well, 
e either way, I don't think the school committee is going to be going to be saying or mandating uh, a level. I think that would still come down from from a, a state guideline rather than us dictating. And again, my opinion, us dictating what a level or or some level of mandatory uh, uh, vaccination. Um, and you know, I, I'm certainly not qualified. Uh, is not a virologist, uh, infectious disease specialist, or public health specialist. I, I would, to me, listen to the state because they have specialists and, and knowledge on that that I just am not going to have. Uh, second part is uh, about masks. And to me, I'll, I'll go back to say, you know, it depends on the facts of it and depends on the people deciding uh, that are more knowledgeable than me on the same topic. Uh, it's funny, I had this discussion even at work today. Facts dictate conclusions. Um, if, if facts change such that someone says uh, a mask is effective and efficient and that's the way it's going to go and therefore we should be doing it, I'm going to listen to people who, who actually have that understanding much more than me and I'll give an example of that. And I'm going to give, I'll give two extreme examples, two extreme hypothetical examples. Sorry, it's a yes or no question and then I just blew it. Um, uh, if I said there was a, an elective surgery that someone had to do, and some have heard me say this hypothetical before, and, and we said if our kid had to have elective surgery, it's a no-brainer. Uh, if the hospital said, we're, we're not really going to require masks in the operating room, we would say, are you kidding? And, and, and I say that because it, obviously it's an absurd example. Um, but I say that because the facts dictate the conclusion in a surgery. Of course, that makes sense. Of course, that's going to infection that, that makes sense the facts of what is the uh, the variant I'm hoping and and think that those who would look at that again much more knowledgeable than me would take facts into account and say is it how virulent is it how how uh, what is the mortality rate what is all of those things that would go into it that again I'm not going to play statistician on um, they would take that into account so yes it could be so, so to be direct, yes, it, it could happen again, but it would depend on the facts uh, of the situation and what people that are more knowledgeable than me, than me would, would uh, dictate on that. Okay, so for the vaccination part, I think that is something that heads up from the Board of Health and from the superintendent. So I don't know how much a school committee would weigh in on that. Um, and then as far as masks, I think masks should be optional. Um, okay, so in terms of, um, you know, meeting the 80%, um, you know, um, I think that um, obviously this has been a very unique few years. Um, we do have, as we all know, to, to attend school, our kids have to, I think, um, there's some mandatory childhood vaccinations. Um, the, the COVID vaccine is not part of that yet. I think there's a lot of health information out there. Um, and I think it's really up to families to decide if they're gonna, and, and the 80%, luckily we're, we're not worried about that anymore. Again, going forward, who knows what happens, but I really feel strongly that at this point, with what we know about what we know, it's a family decision, and it seems like a ton of families have made the decision to do so, and I really support that, and I think that's great. But um, moving on to the mask question, um, now it's impossible to say, as Jeff said, you can't predict what's coming. Goodness, we if we'd known that what was coming, I would have been probably dancing on tables a lot more than I have been. Um, <laughs> um, but I do think that, um, again, with the same with the mandates, masking, um, I think is a personal choice. Um, and I would, unless factors really were, um, against that, I would, I would continue to stand by that it's a personal choice. And I also think very important that if people are still making that personal choice, that we have to be very supportive. Um, so two things. I want to just clarify that I that eighty percent number had nothing to do with Dr. Daly. That was came from Desi. That in order to request that we not wear masks, that eighty percent of any school building had to be vaccinated. It had literally not. He had no cop role in that whatsoever. He was following guidelines. 
And I understand that for some folks, not following the following guidelines is optional, but the reality of the situation is that that is how we get money for our schools. So forget sports. If we want to still have math, we have to follow DESE guidelines. So um, I think that that's the answer to the first question um, is that I don't think that uh, Dr. Daly had any rule on that 80% number. And I think that it's important that um, we provide families that are looking for opportunities to be vaccinated those opportunities. In terms of whether or not I think that we should go back to requiring masks for anyone, again, this is sort of like if you would ask any of us running three years ago for these same seats, if we were ever going to require masks, we'd say no. The world is a complicated place. I am not going to make a promise that no circumstance happens in which I would never um, like be on board with requiring masks, but those circumstances involve important doctors at the CDC and the Department of Health making that recommendation for all of our kids. Uh, I'm always for listening to people who you know know more about these things than I do. And I'm just going to take two quick points of personal privilege. One is if you didn't get your answer, get question, get to ask your question, feel free to talk to me afterwards. I'm, I don't know if these other gen lovely candidates would like to do the same, but I know there was some hands raised when we did our last question. And lastly, I just want to be clear about means testing. I am 100% against means testing. And I, I just think that asking someone to prove their poorness to me is really insulting. And I would never, I'd rather us keep flat fees and, you know, <coughs> but saying you have to show me your, you, you have to prove to me that you really truly can't afford this. I don't trust your own personal judgment about whether or not you can afford this. Is truly insulting to people who don't have the same resources as us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a very uh, informative evening. I, I do have a question. Uh, so I want to clarify something here, if we, if we can. Um, as the circumstances regarding John Barrett, John Barrett is not. He was invited to be here, and he said he would be here. But I received notice from John Barrett that he was not running for the school committee. So I'm hoping with Michelle here that she would be able to clarify the status of John Barrett. Uh, as far as he's not running. Okay. Good. Okay. So we're clear on that. All right. So. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank all the candidates, all the incumbents, everybody for um, doing, uh, uh, standing up and willing to take these tough questions. I often wish I didn't do this because I kind of would like to be in that because every time I heard a question, an answer, I might want to go like that, you know? So, but um, uh, you asked hard questions. I said they would be hard questions and I thank you all for being here. And I think this was a, Real, real plus for North Reading. Thank you all very, very much.